yeah so guys thank yeah thank you thanks for having me along and, and just sort of I guess just share that share the story about who we are where we where we've come from and, and I guess where we're hoping to hoping to go so um I've, I've got a bit of a Scottish flavor to it in terms of some of the work that we're doing up here um but just going to generally start by a sort of introduction to Project Seagrass so yeah Project Seagrass um we founded back in 2013 it was um I'd, I'd been previously working as a secondary school science teacher and as a diving instructor um, over in uh, over in the Pacific, and I turned up at Swansea University to to do a master's, and I started reading my supervisor's um, academic papers on seagrass ecosystems, and it kind of blew my mind that um, these ecosystems um, offered so much, you know, fisheries, food security, biodiversity, carbon storage, nutrient cycling, a whole suite of ecosystem services, and no one had ever heard of this this habitat, and um, I guess it, I felt that particularly acutely because I've been a secondary school science teacher, biology teacher, um, and, a, and a diving instructor. So I spent a lot of time in the water. And so I figured if I hadn't demographically heard about this ecosystem, then not many people had. Um, I spoke to Rich Unsworth about this and, and um, another colleague of mine, Ben, at the dive club. And essentially, we set up Project Seagrass to start with as a sort of um, a voice or a, a platform for communicating seagrass science in a way that was um digestible for the public like how can we take some of the, the scientific messaging and, and boil it down to what the public needs to know you know so more seagrass equals more fish so you know something as simple as that um and there's also an opportunity to try and make seagrass a bit bit more of an attractive ecosystem um there's a marine scientist called carlos duarte who you may have um heard of and he called seagrass the ugly duckling of marine conservation because it just wasn't getting the, the sort of levels of research and funding that was being channeled towards you know the, the poster child like coral reefs so um yeah so we just wanted to sort of basically put seagrass up there on uh in the marine conservation conversation so th this is our our mission and our our vision statements from the website um the vision there is a world in which seagrass meadow is a thriving abundant and well-managed people and planet and i think that's an important thing to reflect on is that we are and we set out to be a global facing organization so it's always been um uh we've always set out to, to communicate seagrass science globally and that's been particularly challenged i think in the past few few years where there's been such a focus in on nature-based solutions in the uk and the uk narrative um but we we do try and, and champion seagrass um ecosystems globally um as an, as an organization we are a we're a charity um now so we are a registered charity in england and wales so we've set up that way and we're a charity in scotland too um we're supporting partners of both of these decades so the un decade on ecosystem restoration and uh the UN, the ocean decade and both of these decades are uh, offer us um, i guess vehicles in a way towards that sort of 2030 target which we're all working towards um ecosystem restoration i'm going to talk a little bit later on about the the, the seagrass restoration work that we do uh, and sort of the the action that we can take, or you know, how can we how can we convert what the science that we were doing into something um, actionable, but also just the need for doing better science on 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 seagrass ecosystems. We're part of a, a, a research um, program now called Reso UK, and essentially we're looking to address the ecosystem service gaps and the knowledge gaps um, over the next three years in and around UK seagrass ecosystems, which aren't directly comparable. To, to global seagrass ecosystems, and especially the fact that a lot of the data that we get comes out of the likes of Australia, which are completely different species in a completely different place. And so some of the headline figures um, you, you might see around seagrass ecosystems just don't apply here. And that, that for me, is, um, is a bugbear of mine at the moment anyway. So next 10 years, these are the two decades that we're, we're working closely with to, to try and push forward seagrass science. Um, to draw a little bit down into what seagrasses are, um, there's about 70, 60 to 70 species globally. I think 72 I've seen cited a few times from four genus. Um, we only have one genus in the UK, it's, a Zost it's Zostra, and there's two species there. So we've got Zostra mariner on the, on the left, um, that tends to be found in the subtidal environment. So shallow, sheltered, coastal, bays, lochs. Um, it's a plant, so it needs... Uh, it needs access to sunlight to photosynthesize. Um, and we've come at this from um, a, a background of really being interested in, in what species were living in seagrass from a food security perspective. Uh, and so a lot of the work that we still do is in that 
um, subtitle with that subtitle plant. The species on the right, Zostra nolti, is a much more diminutive plant. It's found uh, much higher up on the intertidal, um, usually associated just on the edge of, on, of salt marsh too. Um, and it's a really important habitat for migratory bird species, birds like widgeon, brent geese. Um, so we tend to find this, these, this dwarf field grass in some of these east coast estuaries like the Cromarty, um, the Doorknock. You might find it, uh, where's, where's a really good spot? spot? Um, Mont Montrose Wildlife Basin is another spot where you find a lot of uh, nolti. Whereas eel, eel grass tends to be found, um, as I say, subtidally um, and actually can vary in size quite a lot. So in the intertidal zone, or like the lower intertidal, it may only be 30 or 40 centimetres in length during the summer. Whereas in Orkney, it can probably be reaching or near enough two metres, maybe 1.8 metres, something like that. So physically, the the plant can appear very differently depending upon uh, its location. Um, like I said, we came at this as four marine biologists who set up Project Seagrass as um, really from a, a food security food security perspective. Richard Unsworth and Leanne, Colin Unsworth, um, they did a lot of their research in the Indo-Pacific. And so um, what they were, were doing was linking uh, food security um, to the presence of seagrass meadows and, and the degradation of seagrass meadows to the lack of food security. Um, so when we when they first arrived back uh, in the UK in, uh, in the late twenty two late two thousands, um, the, they started looking into into these so coupled socio ecological systems here, um, and, and part of that was actually documenting what species were using seagrass meadows as a nursery habitat. So. Um, it says here over 50 species of fish have been recorded in, in British seagrass meadows, but that's actually really from quite a, a low latitudinal um, range. I think that's really based upon a few papers from North Wales, a couple from South Wales, and, and then some from Southern England. Whereas if we consider, you know, Shetland to the Channel Islands is a, is a long range, and there's going to be a huge latitudinal variation of species that are using um, the, the same plant, the same Zoster mariner, but over that latitudinal range. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see that. Um, that, that figure that be bumped up in the next few years. So that's a, an example of the sort of biodiversity benefits. But um, one of the big things that's dominated the conversation at the moment is, um, is blue carbon. So blue carbon broadly covers any carbon in, in the marine space. That could be anything from you know, a, a whale swimming out into the middle of the ocean and dying and, and falling to the sea floor through to, to seagrass ecosystems, which are a bit more static and conventional in the way that we think about uh, carbon sequestration. Um, one of the figures you'll have seen imported in into the UK context is this 35 times more effective than a tropical forest. I don't know if you, you've seen that, but this is a bugbear for me because um, one of the reasons why seagrass has come to prominence, I think, in the conversation in the past 12 to 18 months has been this um, capacity for seagrasses to sequester carbon. Um, but there's a huge, I think, illiter illiteracy around the whole carbon uh, conversation at the moment because seagrasses and trees for example um, the carbon stored in very different ways in the trees it's in the trunk it's in the vegetation whereas in seagrass meadows we're actually quite interested in the seagrass that gets buried into the sediment uh, and then there's a difference between the amount that's, that's buried into the sediment the store and the rate at which it's sequestered and that figure comes from a rate so there's there's a huge number of nuances to that um that statement and I just don't find it particularly useful to be comparing apples with oranges. Um, and also, it's a global figure, it's not UK based. But that aside, seagrass meadows are globally an effective carbon store. Um, and that's where there's a lot of interest in mapping seagrass meadows towards nationally determined contributions, etc. Um, and then there's the, I guess, in the UK context, there's the, um, and global context, but there, in the UK context, there's seahorses. So, well, I think when we first set up Project Seagrass, we started looking at some of the sort of flagship animals, flagship species that might be, might be used to, to sort of raise awareness of the habitat. Now, in the south of England, where this photo was taken, um, there's, well, there's particularly one site in Studland Bay where there's a large number of seahorses have been recorded and they're all living in the seagrass meadow. Um, and there's anecdotal evidence of seahorses being uh, found in seagrass meadows elsewhere around the UK. But... Um, we, we rapidly moved away from communicating, you know, you should save the seagrass because then you get save, save the seahorse because we felt you needed to save the seagrass for the seagrass's sake, uh, not just the, the animal that lives in it. But certainly animals like seahorses in the UK context or uh, manatees, dugong, sea turtles, 
uh, all of which eat seagrass meadows or eat seagrass, um, have been useful for us to sort of communicate uh, to the public the reasons why, uh, one of the reasons as to why, you know, we should protect these habitats because if we don't have seagrass, sea, sea turtles to eat or manatees or dugongs, then um, we're going to lose the manatees and dugongs and sea turtles. So anyway, that's, I guess, a bit of a, an overview of what we've, um, what we're about, of, of seagrass and what we're about. Um, but this is just a few things of what we've been doing in Scotland in the past few years. So um, genetic study, uh, this is a collaboration between Nature Scott and, and the RBGE. Um, we've been doing some mapping seagrass. Um, that's with uh, Marine Scotland. Uh, and we've got plans to expand that UK wide using satellites. And then um, active seagrass restoration. So if I just start with the, the genetics, um, if you have a look at this diagram on the right, or the screenshot really on the right-hand side, um, these are uh, locations of where we've been to that site and we've collected um, eelgrass, so zostomarina uh, tissue samples, and we um, brought them back to the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh for an analysis. And the um, uh, Dr. Aileen Finger there has, has used 37 microsatellites to basically con compare the connectivity of all these different meadows around Scotland. Um, because essentially what we're wanting to know is before we start moving any seeds around to inform restoration projects, how connected are these meadows? You know, are, do we have a great diversity of, uh, of, of Zostomarin in Scotland? It'd be a surprise because we don't elsewhere in the North Atlantic, but um, like, is that what, what variation is there? And the, the data we've had back so far is that there seems to be like a rough east-west split um, and there seems to be a, a very rough north-south split as well. Um, but broadly speaking, there isn't much genetic variation in, in the plant across, across Scotland, or indeed the UK, because actually this, this uh, project's expanded now. So you'll also notice there's one site in the northeast of England at Lindisfarne National Nature Reserve in that photo on the right hand side. And there's one also in um, Porth Decline in, in North Wales. Both of these meadows are significant um, uh, seagrass meadows that, that currently exist where, the, where, where feasibly, if we couldn't ha have access to seeds to restore our own meadows here in Scotland, we might be able to approach those meadows and get donor seed. Um, as it stands, based on the work that we've been doing, there's some quite significant meadows that exist in Scotland. And so we should be able to source seeds um, for our own restoration projects within, within national boundaries. Um, so this work was done in um, in yeah autumn 2020. As I say, it's actually expanded and continued through now into this year. We've got some samples from as far south as the, as the Channel Islands, from as far east as, um, the, as Sweden, actually, to help connect this with the Swedish study. Uh, and then Galway Bay in Ireland, I think, is the furthest west. Um, and whilst we were doing the, whilst we we're collecting the tissue samples, we we're also cap, um, capturing some data around uh, canopy height, percentage cover. There's an established seagrass watch methodology that we've been following, uh, and that helps to give us to help us characterise the seagrass beds that we're taking the, the genetic samples for, from. Because one of the things we're interested in is if we were to take, let's say, Orcadian seed, and for example, move it into the Firth of Forth, or move it into a into a more intertidal location. If it's growing to two meters in the in Orkney, what's it that what's that going to look like in the Firth of Forth? Is it going to be able to survive in that environment, etc.? So there's a lot of work to be done there. The, the second element that we've been looking at in Scotland is remote sensing. Um, you'll be looking at both those photos going, that's not Scotland, and that's absolutely right. The, right, the photo on the right is Cambodia, and the photo on the, on the left is, is Greece. But remote sensing basically relates to looking at something, or in this case, from above. So we're either using drones to look directly down at habitats and create maps, or we're using satellites to look down at habitat and create maps. Um, but you can see from both of these images where you've got good water clarity, you can actually see the seabed where in, in shallow locations. Um, we started doing this work, or I started doing this work back in 2014, I think it was for my, my PhD. And I was using this um, entry level uh, DJI drone um, you might be familiar with. And this is a little screenshot from um, one of the images you take, just as the camera pointing straight down. Uh, and you can see the dark patches are showing seagrass, uh, the light patches are sand, and the slightly lighter green is this sort of rocky algal um, com complex. And so what that's able to do is give an understanding or distribution of the mosaic of habitats and the makeup of habitats in that marine space. Now, over the past seven years, technology has moved on a, a lot, and we've moved away from the, these entry-level drones into um, bespoke survey drones. So this is a 
a fixed wing vertical takeoff and landing drone called a, a wing for one. Um, and what this allows us to do essentially is to cover much larger areas. So um, on a, if, this, if you have a look at this um, image on the right hand side there, ground sampling distance relates to how, how big each pixel is, um, or what, how each pic, what does each pixel represent in real life in terms of resolution? So 1.2 centimeters per pixel is a, is a very high resolution. And that, that uh, drone there can cover 110 hectares on a, on a flight if it's flying at 93 meters. So it gives you this capacity to cover an enormous area and create very, very high resolution maps um, from which we can pick out what things that are seagrass, we can try and pick out things that are seagrass or not seagrass or um, you know, basically understand that, that habitat mosaic. So that's useful both for restoration projects, but also just understanding distribution of, of habitats within the seascape. Um, these are some of the outputs that we, we might generate. So on the, the photo on the left, there is a, it's called an author mosaic, but it's essentially lots of images which are taken together and overlaid. Uh, and they will stitch together by a piece of software called Pix4D. Um, and they'll create that sort of mega, mega photo. Um, and you can see the, the, the salt marsh on the, on, the, on the left side of the image. And then you might be able to make out some, some green. That's Ostranolti. So that's that dwarf, dwarf eelgrass on, on the right-hand side. And then the image on the right is um, an, a Zoster mariner bed. So a subtitle, a Zostra bed over in Loch Craig, Nish and Argyle. Um, and it's actually here um, that we've been doing some work supporting a community-led restoration project, um, which I'll put a link to. Um, we released a video about it today. In the end of the in the end of the talk. So, why is it important that we map all these habitats? Well, unfortunately, at the moment, the data we've got in our um, in our national data sets is quite poor for this. So the, the best available data sets in terms of it's the most accurate if you want to go to the exact GPS lo location and find what you're looking for is Marine Scotland's uh, NMPI. Um, but, and as you can see, there's a, there's a fair distribution of in the Zoster Mariner layer uh, in that image, um, but it's by no means, um, you know, we don't have, we don't have all coverage. We've, we found seagrass meadows, which are, will soon be added to this data set. But also when you look at, when you explore the data layer, a lot of the, the data points are just GPS points. So it, within this NMPI, each of those squares or triangles represents a feature. And I think a feature is a five meter by five meter um, uh, coverage of, of that particular habitat. So in this case, Zoster Mariner. And whilst that's useful, it doesn't tell us anything about the actual extent of, of the habitat we've got. So, you know, we can't infer from, from this um, how big those seagrass meadows are and therefore what are the likely ecosystem services being provided by that meadow. And so what we want to do is to turn that point data into polygon data uh, like this. So this is a screenshot again from the NMPI, but over for the Outer Hebrides. And you can see here, you've actually got the distribution of the habitats within the, within the seascape. And from that, we can work out exactly how many meters squared we've got. And then from that, you'd be able to work out proxies for you know, the amount of nutrients that are likely to be cycled, or the amount of carbon that's likely to be stored, or biodiversity or fishery supply, or whatever that may be. So, um, how do we do that again? So, this is just a this is a, um, a live um, example. You can see uh, in the false color, color image the, the the outline of the of the seagrass meadow. So, this is again North Mosaic that's been taken false colored, and all the purple points are just ground truth. So, it's um, Nature Scott and Harry Watt dive team. I've just been through and, and just said underneath that purple spot, there is a, yes, it's definitely Zoster Mariner. And so what that gives me is confidence to say, well, actually I can draw an almost an outline around um, that, uh, that bed and say, that's all, all Zoster Mariner. There's some gaps in the middle um, where the, the computer has been unable to stitch together the photos. And all that is, is it's just hundred percent dead seagrass. There's no defining features between the two adjacent photos that allow the computer to stitch it. So we, we know that's a fairly dense um, dense bed. It also tells me I need to go back and fly the drone again in that top right-hand corner because I didn't cover that northeast part of the, uh, the bay with that flight. And then the final bit we've been doing in Scotland, and, and we're going to be doing more, more of this in the Firth of Forth next year, is, is restoration. So we so far in Scotland, we've only been supporting um, a community group, Sea Wilding, but we're actually working to... to to support some further community groups, and that's on the West Coast, uh, on the East Coast, um, as of next year. Seagrass is a plant, 
So essentially, we just think of ourselves probably as underwater gardeners. Um, if you look on that first image, uh, the flowers are those little Vs. So they don't think of, they're not flowers like you buy in Marks and Spencers, but those are uh, Zoster Mariner flowers. Those flowers will produce seeds. And all we're doing is we're collecting the seeds and then planting those seeds where, uh, where they'll germinate. So somewhere which is, you know, has access to light, is a soft sediment. And we go back and we, we, we check on how they're doing. So this is a Sam, a photo of Sam, at one of the restoration plots from, from last year or the, probably the year before now. And as you can see, there's a small cluster of um, seagrasses where we would have planted one of our Hessian bags. The, 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 the sort of take home message with restoration, and it's always limited by funds and, and in some case political ambition, but is think big. Um, survival goes up if you think big. Growth rate grows up if you think big. If you're going to make a change to an ecosystem, you need to put enough of the ecosystem engineer back into that habitat or into that space for it to, to do its job. If you put 10 or 20 bags into a bay, it's not going to change the outcome. But if you put, you know, two hectares worth of seagrass down, um, a million seeds, then, then you can begin to start seeing changes in that, in that space. And the science behind this is, is all we're looking to do is, is to take a, a habitat from, from B, unvegetated, where you get this bare sand and you get this sedimentary suspension, towards A, where you've got a seagrass dominated ecosystem the the seagrass because it's a plant and it's not an algae it has roots and rhizomes and those roots and rhizomes bind that seed floor together that prevents the sediment resuspension it helps with you get the water clarity which is again better, better beneficial for the seagrass and this positive feedback loop and so if we're able to, to put enough seagrass seeds in to flip the system we see we are able to see um significant uh, recovery of these habitats um, what does this look like? Well, the seeds are almost like found in pods, like you see there on the right hand side. And as it stands, we send out you know, snorkelers, waders, uh, scuba divers, and we collect as many of those seeds as we can every summer. And those seeds are usually ready to be picked, again, depending upon latitude in, in the first two weeks of August. Um, the processing, we just it's sim simply, we're just re re uh, recreating the SSC in the lab. So we rot the rest of the plant material down, uh, and separate out those seeds. Uh, the, the seeds we put into hessian bags, so 50, 50 seeds per hessian bag, and those seeds we tie at one meter, one meter intervals along the rope, so it allows the, the, um, the, bed, the, the bags to be in space at one meter along the seabed. Um, and we lower them off the side of a rib. And so essentially all you're doing is zigzagging along the seabed, dropping those hessian bags onto the seafloor, and then you'll be able to go back the following year and in, if everything's gone according to plan, see uh, little plants, um, shoots growing up at every, every meter on the seafloor. And if we have a look at this image here, this is a photo taken just after we were allowed out after the first lockdown. And you can see the rope running from sort of the, the bottom left to the top right. Uh, underneath that, that little bit of algae is, is I think three shoots of seagrass there. Um, they'll all come from the one bag. Behind the dive a metre away, there'll be a second, there'll be another bag with another two or three uh, successful germinations and just out of shot under Blaze Bullymore's name, there'll be, a, there'll be another one. So along the seabed at these intervals, you'll see these, these um, little clusters of seagrass. So like I said, there's two projects happening in Scotland at the moment. Sea Wilding are doing an amazing job over on the West Coast. And Restoration Forth is a project that was launched um, just before COP there. Um, and it's going to be looking to, to engage communities over here on the on the east coast with um, both seagrass and oyster restoration. This is a, a film that we released today. I'll, I'll drop the, the link to the YouTube in, in the chat. Uh, and those are my details. Um, if anyone wants to connect with me and talk seagrass, I'm always willing to listen. So, guys, thank you so much for, um, for yeah, just taking the time to um, invite me and, and listen to me. And yeah, any questions, please do ask. That's great. Thanks, uh, Richard. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. I think, um, you know, I'm, like many on the call, probably uh, I'm more of a terrestrial uh, ecologist. And, uh, you know, this is what I've always had a um, deep interest in the, in the sea and the issues around overfishing and all the rest, which um, obviously had impact on on birds and uh, a variety of other things. So it's just really interesting to hear something about the habitats that drive the whole the whole system like that, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. So yeah, it's, mm. it's been a, it's, it, it's, I also think it's um, a big part of the restoration work for me is, is about community engagement uh, and, and, and also giving people agency to do, to, to engage in projects. I think, I think, well, I mean, if, if anyone else is, if everyone else is like me on this call, we're all probably thinking about the things that we can do in our own lives to, to make change. You know, could we become a vegan or could we be, uh, travel less or can we take public transport or what can we do? And people are looking for outlets in the ways that they can, you know, try and affect positive change. And I, for me, the, the biggest um, and most positive thing, thing to come out of these um, these projects has been people just engaging and, and wanting to be involved in the, in the process. Like, how can we help? How can we volunteer? How can we be involved with this? And, and I think the other element of is, you know, with Sea Wilding, for me, they've been inspirational working with them because they approached me saying, you know, can you show us how to do seagrass restoration? Of course. Um, and, and, you know, to have a community which is invested in the health of their own local space and environment and wanting to make those changes and just needing access to, to the understanding of how to do it um, is, you know, is, is brilliant because then you've got that sort of vertical integration all the way from, in this in Seawater's case, government, all the way down to the community. So yeah, it's, it's been yeah, great. Great to see the the research being used at a practical yeah. Level, I guess isn't it? Um, I've I've got a long list of questions, but I've got some questions in the in the chat here. Um, so Ashley is asking: Is there a link between seagrass meadows and wader numbers? So wader uh, bird species. Do you know what? Um, one of the the, the amount of peer-reviewed uh, literature on linking seagrass meadows to um, to birds is really poor. And so, actually, one of the things that we've just started doing some work on is is exactly that. So, we've had a we've had a student, Emma Butterworth, up in Lindisfarne National Nature Reserve, so just down the coast, um, looking at um, what and what what birds in particular are using the the seagrass meadows there. And so, hopefully, over the next few years, I'll be able to answer that question. With some uh, with some data but um yeah. you know i think anecdotally if you there's i imagine elsewhere there, there's been some peer-reviewed science looking at um particularly brent geese and widgeon i think have been documented but there's also this increasing interest in and around why are other birds oyster catchers for example pot potentially using seagrass meadows if they're not eating the seagrass itself and it's probably just because of the um once you once you create that that three-dimensional complex habitat, just like you are for, for nursery fish species, you're creating a, a rich biodiverse environment where there's probably lots of good stuff to eat. And so, you know, that, that work and evidencing that link between other birds using seagrass meadows to forage, not because they're eating the seagrass itself, but because what they're eating is, is in the seagrass and in that, in that space is, is work that needs to be done over the next few years. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, a question from Jenny, how significant is uh, Zystra wasting disease to the health of eelgrass habitat? Yeah, so there's this, there's this sort of commonly held um, or, or much quoted uh, line about seagrass loss in the 1930s, Zystra wasting disease. And I'm sure, I'm sure it did exist and I'm sure it was there. But I think one of the, in the UK context, what one of the big drivers of seagrass decline is um and historically has been water quality so if you think uh zoster marin tends to be found in in let's say well it needs to have light so the the the, the, the more transparent the water column you know your orkneys and the outer hebrides you might find it at seven eight nine ten meters but in coastal waters in in let's say the southeast of england you whether you don't perhaps have that transparency or the southwest of wales you may be only looking at three or four meters um now, in those estuarine and, and really shallow coastal environments, it, it's, well, I guess it's more the estuarine areas where we, we, we know we've lost seagrass meadows. So if, if you think about the Thames estuary, for example, the water quality coming out of the Thames during the height of London's growth and before any of the water quality uh, and water regulations came in to sort of improve water quality would have been horrific. And so all that nutrient loading um, would, have, would, have, would have caused mass stress on, on those, those existing seagrass beds and, and they were lost. Uh, and we still see ecosystems under stress from eutrophication elsewhere uh, around, around the UK at the moment. But I think it's, it's like to have been a number, like multiple stresses. And once you've got multiple stresses adding up, then 
when a disease comes in, it's it's gonna it's gonna um, have a much more significant effect than if the population was more resilient in the first place. So, um, I imagine it was there, but I imagine it was also as a as has been as a, a cause of a, a number of other stresses. And crew stress, yeah, yeah. Um, that's great. Actually, I had, a, I had a question. I suppose links into that is what are the sort of current ongoing threats to existing seagrass meadows? Yeah, so it, it depends globally. Um, there's a whole different range. So, you know, in, in the med where seagrass is found at 40 metres deep, active mobile fishing gear can be can be an issue. Um, I can't see how, except maybe in really like almost accidental number of cases, that would be an issue in, in the UK context, perhaps in the Outer Hebrides or somewhere where you, you're going to be finding it slightly deeper and, and there might be some mobile gear. But generally speaking, in the UK context, it is going to be um runoff so you know what, what's entering the marine environment and actually what i'll do is i'll find a um a link to a paper by ben jones i think it was 2016 but it's the perilous the perilous state of uk seagrasses and i think he was using some stable isotope analysis to look at um tissue samples and what that was showing was that it, again it was water quality which was the major driver um or, or was one of the major threats to these these um uh, sites that he looked at so I know there's a lot of um, uh, noise being made by surface against sewage at the moment about the, um, you know, the, the amount of effluent the water companies are, are still dumping into, into the coastal waters around, um, or around England. I know that campaign isn't like relevant north of the border in the sense that it's not being covered by SS north of the border. But I imagine if you think about the Clyde and, and Edinburgh, we're still going to have Victorian plumbing systems that, um, whilst they've been improved, aren't going to catch everything. So there's 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 definitely still work to be done in our in our estuaries, I'm sure. Okay, great. Um, question from Carolyn: uh, Is the approach to trying to achieve a more to, to achieve more seagrass on a clear water state a bit like alternative stable states in shallow freshwater lakes? Yeah, I, I guess it is to a certain degree. So um, one where we've looked at restoration, we've gone, was it there previously? So, you know, is the using predictive modeling, is the, is the habitat suitable in terms of, is it, is it uh, sil like a silty sediment layer? Is it fairly shallow? Does it have enough light? It's not too exposed. It's not too steep, a, steep a slope. Uh, and generally you can go to like historical data and say, oh, it was there previously. It's been lost because of, most likely because of poor water quality. Water quality, if we know it's improved and we've got evidence for that, maybe this is time to, to put it back. It, I would always favour removal of the pressure rather than the active restoration. It's, it's way cheaper. And also you, you, you're getting rid of the, the issue that's causing the problem in the first place. But in some, in some locations, um, if, the, if the plant's been completely wiped out or if, if there's only a small population like fragment of the population remaining there's not actually enough seeds there for it to, to really recover and to, to to flip back and so yes i guess you're moving from like 100%. sorry say again oh no someone oh is that someone's it's just background noise someone. background noise so um so yeah essentially what you what we are doing is looking to flip the system from what would be a stable but perhaps slightly less productive system into one which is slightly more productive and was there was there previously essentially so um the, probably the best example of this and and the the seagrass restoration projects that we that i'm a spot what we aspire to so this is this what we're doing isn't isn't novel or new seagrass restoration of this nature has been pioneered by jj orth in chesapeake bay for the best part of 20 years and over those 20 years i think he's probably restored in the order of 70 million seeds or perhaps actively like put seeds out and I think I think it's around 600 hectares but they've seen a recovery of 3,612 hectares so 36 mm. kilometers square dish over here we've just done two hectares so it yeah. gives you the idea of scale difference you know um, and so I think the one of the biggest challenges is shifting the culture you know what we what we did with the seagrass restoration seagrass ocean rescue in Dale in 2019 to 21 I was really symbolic. It was a pilot project to say, look, we need to be thinking at scale. And two hectares isn't really scale in my mind, but it's still way more that's been done um, prior to this. And so 
you know, the next step is taking it away from a seagrass narrative and, and putting it into a seascape narrative. Because it's not just about individual habitat restoration, it's about how can we put oysters, seagrass, blue mussels, horse mussels, kelp, salt marsh back, how can we make the, the seascape connected again and, and bring back all those ecosystem service benefits by having that complete seascape connected? Seagrass is just, for me, an accessible way that people can engage because people understand plants. The public understand plants. You, you take seeds, you plant seeds. It's all very accessible because it's intertidal as well. So it's almost a, a gateway into that sort of marine space more broadly, I think. Yeah, okay. And and, and maybe more achievable for local communities to deliver that kind of... Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Excellent. I want, I want to just... We've just got a few more minutes. I just want to go down to a question from Alice on um, how do you select candidate sites for restoration? And I had a similar um, question in terms of Scotland, what's the scope for expanding uh, restoration? So th there's a couple of ways. You can, you can go back to historical historical data, um, which is really poor in Scotland. So it's, it's, it's you, you can't, you, you know, it's really poor in England. It's really poor across the UK. But there are certain locations, let's say the Essex and Suffolk estuaries, where perhaps there's been a history of um, scientific recording, um, and there's some actually some relatively decent data to understand how big these meadows used to be historically. We've seen them loss, and we can we could therefore see potentially how big they could they could be again. But that's that's quite unique. In in most in most places, we we've gotten very little understanding of how much seagrass we've even got today, let alone how much we had historically. Um, so what you can then do is a bit of predictive modelling and and look at various characteristics such as exposure, sediment type, slope, um, and put all that into a computer and say, where, based upon these parameters, do you think seagrass could be found? And you could even give it some training data to say this is where it is found, and therefore it can say, oh, it might be found here, here, and here as well. Um, and then there's actually just going out and having a look yourself and seeing where it does exist. Um, but, you know, to, to use the example of the Firth of Forth, there might well have been seagrass meadows underneath the bridges, but we can't put seagrass back underneath the bridges because the bridges are there. Um, and equally, you know, the whole Firth of Forth has changed so massively because we removed an enormous oyster bed from the middle of it um, during the Scottish Enlightenment. So, you know, that, that whole system's changed. There's a lot more sediment movement now than there ever was. And so it's got to be a bit of trial and error. So, you know, over the next few years for the Firth of Forth project, for example, We'll do a series of trials to see where seagrass, um, where restoration could, where we could restore seagrass essentially. Um, often they might be driven by existing seagrass. So it wouldn't be, it would, under the Scottish framework, it wouldn't be a restoration project, it'd be a reinforcement project or a population reinforcement. Um, and that would all be driven, I guess, by you know, the science and the ecology in, in the traditional sense. Um, but one of the biggest challenges, or one of the biggest barriers to restoration is community and, and local like, well, local people and uh, like marine spatial planning water users do people want restoration there and I, I think one of the one of the things that we're looking to explore actually with, within an academic context over the next few years within this RESO UK project is I can put a link into that is um, why is it that across the UK there are some communities like Cromac over on in Argyle who are knocking on your door saying we want to restore our local patch. Why are they super keen? What's the what is the social drivers that drive that? Whereas other communities um, are absolutely not interested at all and actively hostile to any idea of um, doing anything in the marine space essentially. And I, and I can kind of understand you know some of the historical baggage that comes with um, you know those kind of questions. So coming up from Wales, for example, to Scotland, um, there's more proactive legislation here and around, I think, empowering coastal communities. The way that the MPA process was dealt with in Wales compared to the way it was dealt with up here, um, I think historically has been a lot better. So there's a, there's a bit of distrust in Wales and around um, that the creation of the, the MPAs. And so, you know, there's there's different cultural drivers which are driving those, um, those variations, I think. So, you know, different reasons but 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 fundamentally it's not just about the it's not just about the ecology it's also about the community and, and society yeah. yeah okay excellent that is fantastic um thanks for that um we will leave it at that for now there are some more questions in the chat i don't know if you would be okay just to try and you know, have a look at those and address them 
just in, in, 